Lord, we want you to fill us up. Lord God, we ask you in the name of Jesus to fill us up. Lord, have your way in our hearts, in our minds, and in our souls. Lord God, we come to you deep crying to deep tonight, Lord God. We want you, Jesus. We want you, not the things of this world. We want you first. Oh, Lord, hear our cry. Hear our cry, oh, Lord. We surrender tonight. Can you sing that one more verse, one more time, I surrender? I surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I surrender. And I surrender. And I want to know. Can you give the Lord a hand in his house? God is so beautiful, isn't he? The Lord is so very, very good. You know, we've been talking last week about miracles. Any of you that were here heard about miracles, the miracle power of God. And that miracle power happened when, at the wedding party, when the water vessels were filled and the Lord said, give the drink to the master. And as soon as he took the drink, it became wine. It turned from water to wine. And that shows us what our part is, is that we are the vessels that are filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? So we're vessels filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit through us that those miracles happen. So obviously, the more Holy Spirit we have, and the more, the less of us we have, the more we surrender, the more miracles we experience. Give the Lord a hand right there. So we just need to realize that there is a strategy to Christ how for us here on earth to see more miracles. I want to see miracles. And in our prayer time, we had miracles. We talked about miracles. We see healings and restorations. And this comes from the fact that we surrender. So we surrender, and surrendering means that you literally give yourself to Christ. It means you die to yourself. It means that you let yourself become less, and it's a willful act. The Holy Spirit doesn't take us. He doesn't tell us. We ask, surrender ourselves to Christ. So I'm going to have a little exercise right now in the very beginning. Stand up and put your hands towards the heavens if you can. If you can't do that, that's okay. But if you can, it will benefit you too. When we put our hands up, what we're doing is we're surrendering. And a lot of people don't understand why when we're worshiping, why do we put our hands up? It is meaning we are surrendering. So close your eyes. And say out of your mouth, repeat after me, Lord God, in Jesus' name, I surrender. I surrender. Have your way with me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So what are, you can be seated, what are we surrendering? What is it we're surrendering? We're surrendering everything. We're surrendering anything that matters to us. And I have a list of those things, okay? And I'm going to start with time. We are surrendering time. Do we ever realize that when we say we don't have time to go to church, because I've got this to do, I don't have time to pray because I've got that to do. 
when we don't have time to fellowship with other Christians because that empowers us in the Lord to be together like this, right? But our time is one of the things that God asks for. He wants us, but to have us, we have to give him time. He doesn't come in without us inviting him. So when you have time with the Lord and you surrender yourself to that time, that could look like this. You could wake up in the morning and you could say, Father, 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 are you awake? Are you here? I want time with you. Can I have time with you first? First things first. You know, God talks about tithing. The things we tithe is everything of God. First things first, and God is first. Amen? So there you are, and you're laying in bed, and you're saying, Jesus, I love you. Come into my heart. Thank you for this day. Thank you for my life. Thank you for walking me through the life that you've led me through. Thank you for the good and the bad. Thank you for the good and the ugly. Thank you for all of it, because through all of that I have learned with you, I can do all things through you who strengthen me. We start our day spending time with the Lord. And we always have time because it takes a minute to wake up. How many of you guys wake up real fast? Just poof, raise your hand. Do you wake up really fast? So what you do when you wake up has everything to do with spending time with the Lord. And those of you guys that wake up slower, you've got more time to sit quietly with the Lord. Now, personally, I find myself just taking him, the Holy Spirit with me all day long. So we're always in conversation. You know, we're always talking about stuff. We, we got this relationship going on, and I could come across a friend, and I'd say, hi, but the Holy Spirit didn't leave me when I did that. So when people say they don't have time to spend with the Lord, what are they, they're not realizing that the Lord is with them, that the Lord is our partner. He is always with us. The Holy Spirit is in us, and I can talk to you, and I can still be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you jive it with someone who is also a Christian, and then pretty soon the Holy Spirit is really coming alive, right? Or you come across somebody with your time that doesn't know Jesus, and there you are filled with the Holy Spirit. What happens to that person? They get a touch from God, because you started your day with God, and you invited him into your heart and in your life. What else, what else can we give and surrender to God? What, what is another really important thing that we give? How about our thought life? Our thought life. What if we give our thoughts to God? I wonder if I surrender my thoughts, what his thoughts would be like. Anybody a witness to that? If I surrender my thoughts to him, what would his thoughts be like? His thoughts, his ways, right? It's different, isn't it? When you think about, well, today I'm going to go do this and I'm going to do that, but what has God got planned for you? right? And the car breaks down, and this person calls and needs help, and you had a plan going this way, and all of a sudden you're going this way, right? But that is because God is trying to get your attention, and he's trying to tell you, I want you to do this my way. I want you to surrender your thoughts to me. I want you to have my thoughts over your thoughts, because your thoughts aren't going to be my will, perhaps, I want my thoughts. The Lord wants all of us. He wants us to surrender every part of us. How about our habits? Oh, my goodness. Let's get down to it, right? How about our habits? We all have habits. What would, what would our lives be like if God was invited into our eating habits? Right? Would that donut get eaten? I don't know about you right? But if we invite God into our habits, how we habitually function throughout our day, if we invited and surrendered our habits to the Lord, what would be different? Think about yourself. What would be different if you invited God into your habits? Would you do anything differently? Just kind of self-examine. Let's go deep. Let's, let's take a look at ourselves. How about our activities, what we do what we do for fun, what we spend our time doing. How about our activities? Would the Holy Spirit be happy to travel with you through your activities of the day? 
because he is your partner and he is in you and he is with you all the time. He doesn't leave you. Sometimes you leave him. You walk away, but he never leaves you. He is with you. He is your partner in life, right? What about your activities? What would you be doing? How about your family? How would it be if the Holy Spirit was in your family? How about if you put the Holy Spirit before your family? Do you realize that there's a lot of marriages that are in trouble because one of the members puts the other person before God? That's not biblical. We put God first, and then God directs the marriage in the right direction. Do you know that? So many people think that my husband or my wife is supposed to come first. No, it's God first. And then if you have a husband and a wife both being led by God, you've got a good marriage because God's will is going to be done in that marriage, right? So God is also before our children, a lot of us have children that we're always concerned about, we're always taken care of in one way or another, but God comes before our children. Talk about breaking off codependency, my goodness. Put God first and all of these dysfunctions go away because God does not want that for us. He wants us to be dependent on him and him alone. He wants us to feel satisfied with that relationship, number one. And then he will take care of our children. Amen? Because we all have those concerns with our children. How about our friends? Does the Holy Spirit come before your friends? Or when you have an issue, do you run to your friends instead of talking to the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you? If you talk to the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, then you go to your friend with good news. If you talk with your friend first, you go to your friend with trouble. How about talking to your friend after you talk to God in the name of Jesus? And then together, if they're Christians, you get together and you pray. How about that? How about that? How about serving God that way and letting the Holy Spirit move through us that way? How about our lifestyle? Is our lifestyle something that comes before our relationship with God? Our lifestyle, what we do, what we don't do, how we live, what we purchase, what we don't. Think of God first. Do we put God before all of these things? How about our cars, our transportation? I need a car. How about running out and buying a car and not even consulting the one that can give you the car? Right? I mean, how do we do this? So often we do. We run as though we rule our lives, and we don't. None of us here created ourselves. Not one of us said, I will be now created. Isn't that the truth? And it sounds funny because it is, but the fact is only God can provide your car, your home, your family, your life, your dreams, your purpose. Only God can give you those things. So we want to put God first, right? Once again, say it, I surrender. I surrender it all. How about our finances? How about our finances? You know, that's the tough one. Richard's going to come up and talk right now about that one, and then we'll go back to this list. But but Richard's going to give you a little uh, honesty and share something that he has gone through personally, <laughs> if he makes it here. If I don't trip first. Thank you, babe. I'm going to talk about something that all of us cringe when we have to think about or talk about, <clears throat> and that's our money. Who owns our money? Really? God does, huh? So <clears throat> I had a really, really difficult time for years and years and years when I'd go to church and the pastors would say, you need to tithe. <clears throat> you need to give offering. 
And I just cringe, because who are you to tell me? I got to give you my money. My money, right? It's mine. It's not yours. It's mine. And we just said, it's God's. But what does God tell us? He told us all the way back to the Old Testament. In Malachi 3, 10 through 12, he says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no need. I rebelled against it for years and years and years. It, there was a point where I was making a lot of money. <clears throat> and my rebellious nature of a lot of things brought me down. Judy and I lost everything. We lost our home, we lost our business, we lost our cars. We had a ministry that we put on feeds every Saturday night. And Judy and I would go to these feeds and they thought, oh, the pastors are here to welcome us and to pray over us and all that. We were there because we didn't have any food. We needed to eat just like everybody else that was there. So what brought me from that mental attitude to a new one, I was watching on TBN Pastor Robert Morris, and he told the story about feeding the multitudes, feeding the 5,000. We've all heard that story, right? Okay. Well, that was 5,000 men. They didn't count women and children at that time because for some reason they were insignificant. So if you count all the people that were actually there listening to Jesus, teaching and preaching, giving the word of God, you probably had anywhere from 15 to 20,000 people. Okay? That's a lot of people. Well, Jesus was preaching all day long. And it was getting toward evening. And all the disciples were over here in the corner. And <clears throat> they were talking to themselves. And they're going, man, we're really hungry. We need to get Jesus to cut it off. You know? Let's go have something to eat. So Peter was elected because he was kind of the mouth to try to get Jesus to stop. Let the multitudes go and let's go have something to eat, Jesus. Come on. So Peter's up there going, come on, Jesus, you know, time to cut it, cut it. Jesus kept right on teaching. So he went back to the disciples and, you know, hey, he's not listening. They said, well, go talk to him. Go tell him. Go tell them. So Peter said, okay, man, I hate doing this. It's, I really don't like it. But so he went up and he said, hey, Jesus, you know, don't you think it's time to kind of stop? Because all these people are out there and they're really, really hungry. You know, it's getting late. Jesus turned to Peter and said, then go feed them. Peter runs back to the disciples and the disciples said, well, what did he say? He said, for us to go feed them. What are we going to do? How, how are we going to feed all these people? He saw a little boy who had five loaves of bread and two fish. And they asked for it. And Peter runs up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, we gotta, we got to let these people go. All we've got 
are five loaves of bread and two fish. What are we going to do? I mean, how? He said, bring it to me and go have all of the people sit down in groups of 50. What? So, being the obedient Peter that he was, he went and told the disciples, and they went and told all the people to sit in groups of 50. Jesus took the loaves of bread, and he took the two fish, and he raised them to heaven to his Father, and he asked for blessings upon them. Now get this, people. He asked for blessings upon them. And he took it and he broke them and he said, go to each group and pass it out and feed the people. And what happened? Everybody got fed. And what happened after that? They had 12 baskets of food left over. Now, how in the world did that happen? 12 baskets from five loaves of bread and two fish? Unless Jesus blesses it, it cannot grow. Think about that. If I don't give back to God what is his, is he going to bless it? He didn't in the past. But you know what? I started tithing. What he asked for me to tithe. And this is up. I don't care if any of you tithe or give offerings or any of that. This is, this is between you and God. But for me, I have done my tithing and I have given offerings. And they are different. You need to check it out to see what the difference is. But because of that, because of what I have done, because I have given back what is rightfully God's, I have not taken it from him, he has blessed me so abundantly. I have a wonderful job. I make a good income, a really good income. We bought a new home. We have money to go out and buy new furniture if we want it. So what does this mean to you? This means that you need to search yourselves. And you need to ask God what you're supposed to do. It's not for me to tell you. But I guarantee you, because he says, he says, test me. This is the only time he says, test me. That's with our finances, because we hold that so dear. It's in my back pocket. It's in my wallet. It's mine. No, it's not mine. And until we start thinking about surrendering everything, this is about surrender. Surrender to the word of God. He says, test me. And I will open the windows of heaven for you like you won't believe. So that's for you to think about tonight. Thank you. You know, I think, I think surrendering our finances is probably one of the toughest ones that we have to surrender, isn't it? Because we do think the money is ours, but the fact is it never was. Because it's God that gave you the job, and God gave you the abilities to get the job, and God gave you everything you needed to be able to move forward and care for yourselves. But it comes from God, not from us. But we have this tendency to think, as with all these other things that we're talking about, that it's ours but honestly everything in life belongs to god that is what we're talking about is surrendering 
everything about ourselves, our family, our finances, our home, every single thing to God, your health, sur surrendering your jobs, your ministries, everything that is important to you, I urge you to hang loosely to it. Because if you don't, it can be taken from you, and we are a witness of that. And that rebellion was a beautiful lesson for us. And I'm sure that there's areas of things you're holding tight to. Here's another one that comes to my mind that we haven't yet talked about to surrender, but sometimes we have health issues, and we call it my whatever, my arthritis my anxiety, my whatever it is. And when you call it that, it becomes yours. It really does. But, you know, you want to surrender that to God. You want to not call that yours because God wouldn't give you that. So you know where it comes from. It's not from God. How about my addiction? Anybody in this room ever dealt with that one, huh? My addiction? No, uh If you don't, you don't hang on to that like it's something with power because it's not. It's nothing. You just say, here you go, Lord, take this. It's yours. I don't want it. And you leave it over here. And you know what happens? You walk free. You're out of bondage because you surrendered it to God. And surrender means that you give it over completely. You give it over completely. You give everything about yourself over so completely that it is no longer on your mental agenda and you are set free. You know, the word surrender comes from this scripture, Philippians 2, 7, and 8. And Christ is our example of surrender. And you think, what did Christ do for us as a surrender? But he made himself of no reputation. We're worried about our reputation all the time. But you know what? We surrender our reputation to Christ. And do you know what happens? And he took him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. God himself did that as an example to us. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And he became obedient to God, even to the death on the cross. So Jesus is our example of surrender. He surrendered himself to God, to be used by God. And there was at a time when he said, take this wrath from me, take this cup from me. But no, he didn't. He went ahead and he stayed in the will of the Father because he surrendered himself and all that he was to God. He laid that down. Now, I feel like you're all stirred up thinking about all those areas that you want to surrender because anything we hang tightly to owns us. And we don't want to be owned by anything but God. We want to walk freely, don't we? We want to walk in victory. We want to walk in success and health and wealth and well-being, prosperity in all areas of our life. But the only way to do that is to hold loosely to the things of this world because it is of no benefit to us to hang on tightly to any of them. So I'm going to pray with us, and we're going to worship a little more. Do you guys want to stand up and, and stretch out a little bit and, and take a moment to think about this very deep process of surrender? What do you need to surrender? Do you need to surrender some rebellion, something that you know that you're holding on to? Do you need to surrender to yourself saying that you're not healthy because God only gives health? Do you need to surrender to addiction? Do you need to surrender your finances, your home, your children, your mate? Whatever it is, I suggest as I pray, you throw those arms up and you surrender it 